I know we have a lot of people online, so thank you also for joining us, those of you who are joining us virtually. So my name is Rebecca Bill Chavez. I'm president and CEO of the Inter-American Dialogue. I think many of you in the room know us, but we've been around 40 years and we focus on promoting democratic governance, something we'll hear about today, um, shared prosperity and social equality. And it is such a pleasure for me to introduce Ambassador Frank Mora, permanent representative of the United States to the Organization of the American States. Ambassador Mora has dedicated his career to the Americas, both as an academic, but also as a, um, a public servant. And I consider myself very lucky to have crossed paths with you at various points in our, in our careers, and also to call you a friend. In the world of academia, Professor Mora has had a tremendous impact on students at Florida International University, at the National Defense University and at Rhodes College. And I am particularly grateful to Ambassador Mora because you've done so much to help create a pipeline of talent on and of young people. And some of them I think are, are now our colleagues, um, but um, pipe, <laughs> we're very old, <laughs> but a pipeline of talent focused on inter-American relations and the politics of Latin America and the Caribbean. He's also been a thought leader, including during his seven year tenure as director of the Kimberly Green Latin America and Caribbean Center at Florida International University. As a former academic myself, I can tell you that Frank's scholarship has been among the best, demonstrating a deep understanding of the complexity of regional politics. In the public sphere, Ambassador Mora served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere Affairs from 2009 to 2013 um, during the administration of President Obama. Under Ambassador Mora's leadership, the Defense Department made tremendous strides in advancing shared interest in Latin America and the Caribbean, in large part because as Deputy Assistant Secretary, Ambassador Mora recognized and emphasized the importance of equal partnership with the countries of the regions in the region. And as the person who followed in Frank's footsteps in the Pentagon, I benefited, benefited greatly from the groundwork that you laid. So welcome Ambassador Mora. We're looking forward to hearing your perspective on the US vision for revitaliz revitalization of multilateralism and the role of the OAS. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for a very generous uh, introduction. Good morning to all of you. Um, good to see friends and colleagues here uh, from the OAS and from the past. Um, Rebecca, I want to thank you, as always, for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak. This is my first real speech outside of the Permanent Council um, uh, to the public. Uh, this is... Um, process that's taken me about eight or nine months to figure things out a little bit, you might say. But thank you for the opportunity for hosting uh, this conversation on, on the challenges and opportunities uh, in our hemisphere. And I want to thank all of you uh, here and, and the virtual world uh, for your interest and for all you do um, uh, in the inter-American system and the community. I've always valued the work that all of you do and the input you give and the advice that you all give to to me and to others as we work through some of these challenges. Today, I wanna take a few minutes to talk about what um, Secretary Blinken often refers to as the power and purpose of American diplomacy. Um, that is revitalizing our partnerships and alliances uh, in pursuit of a more stable, more secure, and more prosperous world. President Biden, you have, I'm sure, heard him talk about how America's back. What does that America being back exactly mean? But it so, means so much, but it also means, or an emphasis is on diplomacy, back in terms of diplomacy. As Rebecca mentioned, uh, I began my service at the OAS at the beginning of this year. And so I want to talk to you about all that we've been doing uh, over the past eight or nine months and what sort of our vision it is for uh, the next uh, year and a half or, or so. Um, and how it fits into our broader vision 
of U.S. foreign policy recommitting itself to addressing the big challenges of our time alongside our partners and our allies and, and so many of you here today. You have heard, I'm sure, that a few weeks ago, Secretary Blinken gave a speech at Johns Hopkins University where he outlined uh, our vision for the road ahead. And I want to say, I want to sort of emphasize an important piece that he mentioned uh, when he said, and I quote, we're building new coalitions to tackle the toughest shared challenges of our time, close quote, meaning investing in a broader set of partners that includes not just national governments, but also local governments and civil society organizations, academia, the private sector, and citizens, especially the young and emerging leaders in the hemisphere. And as we often said, and certainly I've said, uh, at the heart of our strategy is an understanding that if we're going to commit ourselves to truly addressing the challenges of our day in a lasting and in a sustainable way, we cannot go it alone. I repeat that message today and I will keep repeating it even long after I am ambassador to the OAS. The thinking applies to global challenges, but also to hemispheric ones. The multitude of challenges we as a hemisphere face today are often interconnected with for the US government solve all of them, it is critical that we think of those challenges in very interconnected ways. As we, always, uh, as we always have, the United States will lead with purpose, with confidence, and with a collaborative spirit. Indeed, there is arguably no greater show of strength, no better use of our influence and resources than the decision to invest in strengthening international around a rule-based world order. Particularly at this moment, I would say, when we see a number of countries bent to undermining that order. In a world as complex as the one we lead today, our security and stability depends on our ability to bring countries along with us in pursuit of shared goals and responsibilities. That is why under this administration, we have doubled down on diplomacy, and that is why we have doubled down on the importance of the Organization of America. The record is clear, and it is one impact. That is the sort of word that we use in the mission. What is the impact? Over the past many months, we have demonstrated again and again that the, US, the OAS is uniquely position to mobilize countries, to establish consensus, to set agendas, and bring about positive change in our hemisphere. We have seen it as an example in recent developments with respect to Guatemala, something that I will come back to a little later on. To that end, at every turn, we have invested in identifying and building an ever-expanding 10 countries that are able to find common ground on core issues. In that effort, historically, the evidence is clear. Fellow democracies have long been our best partners. That's why President Biden convened two summits for democracy to bring together leaders from democracies big and small to galvanize global engagement in, on challenges that today transcend borders and continents. The role of the region and the OAS in collective global initiatives, such as the Community of Democracies, the Open Government Partnership, and the Freedom Online Coalition, further exemplifies the strength and resilience of democratic values when supported by the concerted effort of like-minded countries. We are seeing these engagements bear fruit every day. And at the OAS, we are as active as ever, working with diverse coalition of countries to address the biggest challenges and opportunities in our hemisphere and at the organization itself. Um, we saw how uh, a few months ago, the Permanent Council 
together, came together to support the first ever increase in the organization's budget in over a decade. That was an important accomplishment. And I think an important signal of all the member states' commitment to the institution. Now, I wanna talk also about some of those challenges. In our hemisphere, and as you all know better than I, one issue that we cannot ignore is of course democratic erosion, which today threatens hard fought progress that made Latin America and the Caribbean the, the second most democratic region in the world. As you all know, the erosion is global. All around the world, autocracy is making gains against democracy, revisionist powers are challenging the norms and values that anchor um, the international system. According to Freedom House, and you all have seen this data, countries that suffered democratic declines in 2021 un outnumbered those that improved by more than two to one. In our region in particular, the report from the Economist Intelligence Unit shows that though Latin America and the Caribbean remains the region with the biggest average democratic score outside of North America and Western Europe, in Latin America, just over 39% of the public reports satisfaction with how democratic systems is working in its own, in, in respective countries. The lowest average recorded since the polling began by The Economist in 2004. So overall, we're seeing increased skepticism about whether democracy can deliver and this skepticism is of great concern to us and our national security. We should be clear about this. People in the Americas are disaffected, frustrated, disenchanted with the performance of democracy. And that has repercussions in ju not just in terms of the rise of anti-democratic forces, but also what those anti-democratic forces might mean for security, human rights in our hemisphere. People today are looking for alternatives to democracy. And as they search, authoritarian rule bending powers are not sitting idly by. They're increasingly collaborating with one another to spread new forms of autocratic governance. This is not some hypothetical, this is happening right now posing great challenges to key principles of the international order enshrined in the UN Charter, the OAS Charter, and of course, our priority, the inter-American democracy. So we must be honest with ourselves in terms of the performance of democracy, and it is not what it should be. And as a result, support for democracy has declined. Again, you are familiar with the data from Latino Barometer, LAPOP, in terms of uh, the seven-point decline that we've seen in prior years. That's a problem. And democracies are fragile. And when they're not delivering, that affects us all, including our national security. Even in the United States, right? Confidence in government institutions has fallen steadily in recent decades from well over 70% in the 1970s to 20%. Today, our democracies are facing unprecedented challenges throughout the world. And in our hemisphere, we see elected leaders attacking independent judiciary, marshalling forces for the state to undermine electoral results and the rule of law and cracking down on human rights defenders and civil society. We see the engines of mis and disinformation, distracting, destroying, dividing. We see deep political polarization and we see states that for no, for one reason or another, simply cannot deliver. And yet democracies, and in particular people's beliefs in democracy, have shown themselves to be remarkably resilient I don't want to give a fatalistic because we are seeing throughout the hemisphere 
because people still believe in democracies, despite their frustration, democracy and institutions are still holding to one degree or another. So today, clear-eyed to all these obstacles, we contend that the way to address the challenges that democracies face is not with less democracy, with more democracy. They're not perfect, meaning democracies are not perfect. And of course they're not. They're not supposed to be. Uh, do they frustrate us? Yes, sure. But we all are familiar with Winston Churchill's dictum, right, about democracy being the worst form of government except for all the others. So democracy has proven time and again that it is the best system. It is the social contract that we have in the world to give voice to our people, to deal with our global challenges and to contribute to a world that is free, open, and prosperous. It is in our self-interest to preserve and protect democracy. And as we do it, it is incumbent upon us to encourage and invite, inspire new ideas, new voices, new visions of how our democracies can deliver. Okay, what's the OAS doing about it? At the OAS, as I said earlier, we are doubling down on our commitment to democracy. Some 22 years ago, as everyone knows, member states committed to the Inter-American Democratic Charter, an instrument with the central aim of strengthening and upholding democratic institutions in the Americas. It is our view that the Charter must continue to be central, indispensable tool for strengthening inclusive democracy in the Americas. Last month, we announced, the organization announced, the creation of a voluntary group of OAS member states, supported by 26 countries, that will focus on making good on the promise of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, namely, as the first article of the Charter states, Peoples of the Americas have a right to democracy and their governments have an obligation to promote and defend it. The diverse grouping of countries represents a collective commitment at the OAS to not only addressing democratic erosion in our hemisphere, but to enhancing the standards of all our democracies. This is coalition building at its best. These efforts are more than just words. We at the State Department and at the OAS have put deed, word to deed again and again in the last few months, I believe. We have, for instance, stood up for election integrity in Guatemala when there were efforts and still efforts to subvert the will of the Guatemalan people. Over two rounds of voting in that country, we have, seen, we have been ever vigilant. We the OAS, have been vigilant and, and very active, working tirelessly with civil society and our partners at the OAS to make sure that the Guatemalan people know that the international community is watching. We have also spoken with a powerful and clear united voice, not just across the interagency, but also alongside members at the OAS. And we will continue to do so. When the OAS comes together and speaks with a unified voice to defend a rule-based order, as we have done recently, I believe, we send a signal not just to individual countries that are conf confronting democratic decline, declines, but to others who might consider charting a similar course. I want to be clear about this. In the case of Guatemala, the OAS and the international community have played a in supporting democracy and the democratic process so far. And Guatemala is just one of many examples where we have shown we are up for the challenge of the moment, where we have built coalitions and gained strength from a diverse group of voices to the calls for upholding democratic values. Working with the OAS and other entities of the inter-American system, we played a key role in denouncing attempts to subvert the constitutional transfer of power in Brazil. 
stared down the coup attempt in Peru and have now mobilized partners around the world to support long time of the people of Haiti. In fact, I am proud to say that tomorrow, the OAS will be adopting a resolution urging member states to redouble their efforts to prioritize assistance to Haiti, consistent with the recent UN Security Council resolution on Haiti. At the OAS, we have worked tirelessly to stand up for uh, stand up working groups to, and establish consensus on issues that affect us all, from Haiti to Nicaragua to independent journalism and LGBTI rights. Convinced that if we both lead with our values and create a space for more voices, ideas, and perspectives, the result will be a more effective. The process of multilater multilateral diplomacy is fundamentally one of consensus building. That is what defines the OAS, consensus building. Whether it's a, a resolution or a declaration or an observation mission, the mere act of establishing this sort of baseline partnership has reverberating effects throughout our hemisphere. We can set new agendas and we can bring coalition of nations along with us in pursuit of a shared policy vision. Part of that policy vision requires that we raise our voices to identify those countries that have fallen short of our shared commitments and values and to make it clear that we are not abandoning those people who still face brutal repression in the hemisphere, in countries like Nicaragua and Cuba, for instance where the cries of those people continue to ring loudly for democracy and freedom. Our work at the State Department at the US, and at the U.S. mission to the OAS centers on supporting those people, on supporting civil society and democracy. In Cuba, we have pushed tirelessly to make sure that the OAS never stops calling attention to brazen attacks on human rights defenders and violators of freedom of expression in that country. Just a few months ago, as many of you may know, for instance, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights issued an important report about the Cuban government's involvement in the murders of the It is important for the international community to know of these appalling acts, and it is important that human rights defenders know that we are all watching. On Nicaragua, as many of you know, though its denouncement of the OAS charter will become effective next month, we will make sure the OAS does not abandon the Nicaraguan people. In fact, the government of Nicaragua has a variety of other continuing obligations to the OAS, including those contained in the American Convention on Human Rights. Whether it's condemning attacks against Catholic Church, or other assaults against reputable, established academic institutions, the U.S. has worked closely with our counterparts, Canada, Chile, and many other countries at the O.S. to stand firm against repression in Nicaragua. Indeed, the State Department has been a global leader in championing human rights in Nicaragua, demanding not only accountability for ongoing repression, but also pushing for the release of political prisoners, perhaps best exemplified by our historic effort at brokering one of the biggest prisoner releases ever involving the United States in February. Yes. And as we look at threats within the region, we must also be mindful of ways actors from outside uh, of the region foment instability and spread new forms of oppression and autocracy. All throughout the region, we see the case after case of Russian and Chinese influence contributing to the deepening fissures in countries, worsening, exacerbating the economic decline that I mentioned earlier. We see the use of very sophisticated technolo technological tools to spread disinformation and meddle in elections. We, we at the, United, at the State Department, U.S. government are hypersensitive, not just because of what we have seen throughout the region, 
but also because of what we saw here in the United States. And we cannot and will not take this lightly. We have seen this, of course, this movie before, the liberal movements openly welcoming outside forces to corrupt and shatter the very institutions that brought them uh, to power in the first place. And when we talk about democracy, which is, of course, one of the four pillars of the OAS, OAS's mission, we're not simply doing it from an altruistic perspective. We're also doing it because people in the United States find themselves disaffected as well. And we must be alert to the forces that would try to exploit those sentiments in the United States. So we're not alone in taking these challenges head on. For this reason, every day, as members of the OAS and signatories to the Inter-American Democratic Charter, reaffirm our commitment to hold ourselves and each other to the highest possible democratic standard, including the United States of America. So when we stand up for democracies around the world, we are not only standing up for those institutions, but we are in turn strengthening our own commitments to our own values and to our own institutions. Now, we cannot have a conversation without discussing the socioeconomic foundations on which any strong dem democracy rests. We have seen between 1980 and 2020 that the richest 0.1% around the world have accumulated the same wealth as the poorest 50% of the population. As these disparities grow, they also exacerbate citizens' distrust and disillusionment with the systems that govern their lives today with their democracy. This distrust, this disillusionment, in turn chips away the people's faith in democratic institutions. Death by a thousand cuts. And on top of all this is the reality that all across the hemisphere, our systems have been under severe stress, strained by, as you all know, COVID-19 pandemic, which exposed the, the vulnerabilities in our system. And in some cases, outright collapse of our social safety net. This, the region is still reeling from <clears throat> economic fallout of the pandemic. That is why my government continues to promote and insist on inclusive and equitable economic growth across multiple fronts. We are investing in building in the world's most resilient and competitive supply chains, which benefits not only the US economy and US workers, but as well as workers throughout the region. We have found common cause in our hemisphere on shared values including the need to respect and elevate workers' rights, strengthen social safety nets, spur investment opportunity, and of course, combat corruption. Just last month, for instance, President Biden and President Luis Lula da Silva of Brazil announced the Partnership for Workers' Rights, the first joint U.S.-Brazil global initiative to advance the rights of working people around the world. The initiative builds on our efforts across the region, region on racial equity and advanced, advancing workers' protections through bilateral labor dialogues. Last year, as many of you know, we also launched the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, a shared vision for driving regional cooperation on an integrated and sustainable economic agenda for our hemisphere. At every step, we are building coalitions, as I've been saying each committing to promoting responsible investment that will fund high standard infrastructure and the jobs of tomorrow. The 12 countries that, are, that have signed on for APEP, for instance, today represent 90% of the hemisphere's GDP or nearly two thirds of its population. So together we will shape a shared version for the economy of today and of tomorrow. 
At the same time, we have supported the development of sub-regional groupings like the Alliance for Development and Democracy, an initiative to promote democracy and economic growth through commitment to strengthening commercial, agricultural, demographic, cultural ties between the countries, Africa, Panama, Ecuador, and the Dominican Republic. We have worked closely with this coalition of countries on issues big and small, including support for the Democratic Charter. I'm happy that my colleague from Ecuador, Ambassador Mauricio Montalvo, has joined us here today. Alliance like these offer a model of cooperative innovation built around shared values and opportunities that will improve the lives of citizens across the region. Now, in terms of climate change and sustainable development, I want to spend a few minutes here because this is, as you know, important priority. Sustainable growth and development also requires shared commitments uh, to addressing the escalating climate crisis, which represents, as you all know, one of the greatest challenges of our time. All across the hemisphere, we are seeing climate change wreak havoc in our communities, upending economies, disrupting patterns of agricultural productivity, and exacerbating conditions for vulnerable and historically disadvantaged populations. My government recognizes that we cannot address climate change without mobilizing partner nations and investing significantly in climate action. And our efforts to mobilize these coalitions have yielded historic progress. Two years ago, we hosted with Argentina the first ever high-level dialogue on climate action in the Americas, and we have accelerated our commitment to the clean energy transition through the Renewable Energy for Latin America and Caribbean Initiative. As you know, we have worked with Caribbean nations to launch the U.S.-Caribbean Partnership to Address the Climate Crisis 2030, or as 2030, which supports climate adaptation, energy security, and investment in critical climate resilience infrastructure. Recognizing the Caribbean's unique vulnerability to the climate crisis, Vice President Harris has traveled to the region multiple times, as has Secretary Blinken, Special Envoy, Special Envoy for Climate, uh, John Kerry, and many other high-level officials. Earlier this month, uh, I joined representatives of the OS member states in the Bahamas, where we approved the Declaration of Bahamas to enhance access to climate finance in the region and support green growth. Indeed, the U.S. mission to the OAS has been extremely active on questions of climate and sustainable uh, development. This is because we recognize the convening power, the impact that the OAS has in, uh, to spur innovation, collaboration, dialogue, and ultimately action. My government funds the Hemisphere's flagship energy and climate initiative, the Energy and Climate Partnership, also known as ECPA, which is the only multilateral mechanism in the Western Hemisphere focused on advancing sustainable energy and development and cooperation in the region. ECPA stands on six pillars uh, of activity, energy efficiency, energy resilience, cleaner energy resources to promote decarbonization, energy access, regional energy integration, and energy innovation. So let me close by sort of reemphasizing re a couple of points. There is no silver bullet solution to the myriad of global problems in the world today, whether we're talking about climate crisis or food insecurity or social exclusion or democratic erosion. And the scale of these problems, the scale of these problems, not just the diversity, but the scale of these problems often breeds a sort of cynicism. But that cynicism cannot be met with an American alone strategy. Identifying solutions to these global challenges begins with a recognition that many of them are indeed global and that we must forge international cooperation to address them effectively and comprehensively. 
Partnership and coalition building is at the center of our work because it allows us both at the State Department and the OAS to mobilize countries, cities, communities, and civil society actors behind shared visions and opportunities in a way that benefits not only the American people, but the people of the Americas. Multilateral diplomacy that provides an opportunity to bring countries together, to shape the dialogue today and the solutions of tomorrow. Investing in coalition, in coalition building, has borne fruit on issues big and small, from addressing democratic declines to sustainable development to investments in vulnerable communities. We have found common ground again and again at the OAS and shown through these results that democracies can, in fact, deliver. That is our answer to those revisionist powers who are offering a fundamentally different vision from this. Our success, the success of the OAS and other multilateral bodies and the success of this project of coalition building will allow us to tackle 21st century challenges and opportunities head on and build new rules of the road that will allow us to lead, our to lead with our values and our ideals. Coalition building is not just government to government efforts, whether you are an academic, student, student activist, a think tank leader, or a concerned citizen. I invite you to join us in this collective project and to share your views with us as we continue this ongoing process, dialogue and engagement. With that, let me just, uh, again, once again, thank you, Rebecca, for this opportunity and this space to have a dialogue uh, at this very important moment. I'm grateful for the opportunity and look forward to engaging and continuing this discussion with you and conversation, not just here today, but in the months and years ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Mora. I always have high expectations when I interact with you and um, just that was a tour de force. I think that was you. such a compelling and comprehensive vision um, or presentation of a vision, a strategy, a set of priorities. So thank you. I hope you will let us publish this because I think that this needs to be required reading. Um, thank you, thank you. So um, I, I have a, a question. I know that there are others that are very eager um, to, to present questions, but your point um, up front, your framing of the issue that today's most pressing challenges, they transcend borders and this idea that we can't go it alone um, just by their very nature. So whether it be climate change, pandemics, democratic erosion. Um, and so this, this emphasis on coalition building within the OAS, um, this, uh, in particular, I'm curious about the working group on the Inter-American Democratic Charter, how that came about. Um, you said there are 26 countries. It's a diverse group. So I was wondering how the process went when it came to building this, this working group. Um, and also, what countries are taking the lead? And finally, if you don't mind, um, and then I'll open it up. Um, I know that there are some very creative pieces to this. And one, you mentioned that this, one of the challenges is this death by 100 cuts, where you have democratic lead, leaders, elected, democratically elected leaders doing things like attacking the independent judiciary. So this idea of early warnings and where that comes into the conversation. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Rebecca, because we had, we initiated a conversation here, the dialogue where member states, ambassadors came, and we started having initial discussions. So thank you for providing us with this sort of informal space outside of the, outside of the organization, outside of the permanent council. But that led to a sort of discussion. Uh, and, and uh, you know, let, let me backtrack. Um, this is an organization that makes decisions on consensus, right? We, we don't vote often on issues. In fact, I may be wrong about this, but since I've been at the organization, I think we've only voted one, one issue. Everything else is on by consensus. Now, 
it is challenging sometimes because as you know, the region, the Americas, finds itself in a very kind of polarizing moment. So to build consensus in polarizing situations is challenging, but we've worked through them. Um, and we found areas of commonality, of consensus. And I think there's an understanding at, at the organization that democracy is threatened, right? That everyone, I think, um, understands the challenges that democracies face. I, I think there is quite a bit of consensus on that. There are some differences about how we address that, and that's what we've been working on. We didn't have a working group like we have a working group on, on Nicaragua, a working group on Haiti, um, but it was sort of conversations, informal conversations, but sort of moving towards the last General Assembly that we had, where uh, in a sense we created the space, we a mandate, if you will, that allowed us to move forward and how best to strengthen the charter, not to open the charter renegotiation, but to strengthen the charter. And so um, we've moved forward, I think, as an organization on that. We passed a resolution. We actually created the voluntary group and 26 members, as I mentioned, joined. And now we are starting, I think, a process to talk about what does that tangibly, specifically look like. And so that leads me to part of your question, which was an early warning system, you know, the, the OES, now this is sort of view of the United States. I don't want to speak for, for my colleagues, but the, the OES already has MESA-SIC and other mechanisms, follow-up mechanisms to deal with, for example, corruption. Um, that's the model that many, some of us are thinking about. What, what are some of the early warning systems, sort of preventive measures that, or steps that the OS can take. Because if you look at the charter, the charter is very much reacting to crisis, to the moment of interruption, right? Um, but what can we do to provide early warning, uh, sort of a peer review process, not one country to know all of us sort of, and the, and the Secretary for Strengthening Democracy in, in the, at the OS provide us signals that this particular situation is moving in a problematic, right? It's moving towards uh, undermining democracy. And we can, I mean, this is up for discussion. We don't know, right? But maybe the or, there's, there's some things that the organization do to call attention to this. So for example, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on the issue of Guatemala put Guatemala under chapter four, which is, you know, a place where um, clearly the commissioners thought Guatemala's human rights situation is not moving in the right direction. And in a sense, what the commission did is they gave us an early warning signal as to what was coming in Guatemala months, if not years before. And sure enough, boom, right? That's the thing. And now I'm talking as the U.S. here. I'm not, again, talking. But that's the kind of thing that we can do for democracy. To, to address those situations that we believe. Now, what do we do about it? You know, at least calling attention to it, I think would be an important, important step forward. Give the audience a chance to ask um, questions. And I see Manuel Orozco has his hand up. Manuel. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador. And thank you very much for your words because they are really encouraging and, and at this point in time. My concern is that we're dealing with non-cooperative players uh, in a context where you want consensus building and coalition building. And I mean, the, the Palenque Declaration two days ago was, was a slap in the face to human rights when the, these leaders talk about you know, protecting the, rights, the right to migrate, but not the right to stay. In their homelands. Um, so, my, my my question is: What are what do you think are the the diplomatic tools at hand to deal in the current context with the promotion of democracy, the prevention of more democratic backsliding under this uh, non-cooperative context? So, again, uh, the OAS has limitations, Manuel, right? And they're not just 
political limitations, there are limitations with the charter. Right? The issue that often comes up, and I would love to hear the audience, is, ah, but sovereignty, right? How do we, because sovereignty is enshrined in international law, it's enshrined in the OAS charter, right? And it's, you know, and it's sacred, and, and certainly the United States is believes in, in that and respects that wholeheartedly. But there is so people are saying, well, how much can the OAS do that's not that would not become an intrusion in the sovereignty of another country? Um, how does sovereignty not just become the protective shield of authoritarian government? Right, to protect themselves. That's a to me, that's a hard balance to strike. I'm not sure the OAS is the place to address that problem. Although I often say this, and I'll leave it at that before I get into trouble. Um, when we all signed the Inter-American Democratic Charter, when we all sign free trade agreements, we give up at least a little sovereignty, don't we? This is the price of pay living in the context of an interconnected globalized world. Right? The peace of Westphalia that globalization has changed that. By the same token, Mano, I don't believe that the OAS should be intruding and taking actions in the affairs of, uh, in the internal affairs of countries because it might think that there might be some democratic backs. You have to be careful with that as well. So what's the sweet spot? I don't know. I hope that we can have that discussion. Uh, those are some of the limitations and challenges that I think we face. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a question from Danielle. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. I wanted to ask you, um, what are your insights about this paradox between um, democratic satisfaction and democratic backsliding? And let me explain you a little bit. Based on the Latino Marometer data that you mentioned, for instance, in El Salvador, uh, democratic satisfaction is high despite institutional weakness. So we are facing this reality that these leaders that are controlling the institution and controlling power on the executive, they're still very popular in, you know, in their countries and in some regions, some other countries, they want to copy the, these different politics and implement it in their own country. And we are looking at this also in Argentina with Millet, for instance, and our history has shown us many examples, like also not in Brazil, even Trump in the United States. So basically, my question is, um, what are your insights, you know, besides the work of the OAS, but what are your insights based on your professional experience? Of how can we counter- I have insight. <laughs> I work for the, <laughs> I'm not an academic anymore. No, but in general, yeah. how can we counteract not only democratic backsliding, but also this idea of democratic satisfaction when there is institutional weakness? How can we show them that there's like an alternative based on democratic values? I think we need to keep talking about it. We need to keep calling attention to it. We need to empower the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, for example, and other entities of the Inter-American system whose focus is this, right? Um, but you're right, you know, there, there are gonna be member states who, who will not want the organization to lean forward on some of these issues. They believe that their sovereignty needs to be respected. They are a member states of the organization. They have voice and vote and all kinds of things, right? So um, it's tricky. Uh, I'm not saying this is uh, easy for the OAS. Um, and again, I don't, I, I have to, you know, I'm not an academic anymore. And so I speak for the administration. I, uh, I work at the uh, State Department and, and at the OAS, right? So all that means, you know, um, I'm getting used to being a diplomat. Thank you, Frank. Yes, so we have a question here. Thank you. Yes, so my name is Alessandra Pin and I'm the director of the Latin American program at Freedom House. Uh, your words really resonate on me. I think that we are all aware and the Freedom House, we constantly talk and you mentioned our data of the erosion of democracy. And we know about the impact of authoritarian countries are having in this region and around the world, the disinformation. I think uh, your emphasis on uh, coalition building comes to a moment where it is actually 
a little, it's very hard, it's very challenging. Not lots of countries wants to talk about coalitions. We had the Brexit in Europe. Who could imagine that move after all of the inclusion of 2007 and the enlargement? So I think that uh, uh, it's very hard, but I also don't see other solution. And I think that one of the issues that really us as democracies, we lost our proud and proud to be democracies. Right now, it's not trendy anymore. And I think that that is what we need to gain again and to be, to be attractive to those countries that are uh, in what in Freedom House is yellow. So those partially free countries. So my question is, I think that uh, often we put the emphasis on the economic power of democracy. But I think all the evolution in China and a little bit on Russia like, are proving that not necessarily uh, this connection is so strong or there are other solutions that could bring uh, economic development, even if it's not the development that we like, that is a shared development, right? So possibly, how do you see the emphasis on values and going back to the democratic values that because it seems that also there is a lot of uh, lack of empathy in our world. And I think that that could help a little bit on uh, uh, trying to um, reverse the trend of democratic crisis. I love when folks answer their own questions, right? Um, yeah, that's, uh, it's hard to, to disagree with what, what you said. I, I completely agree. But there, there's one piece that I'd like to highlight. As part of this, um, and it's in the mandate that was uh, approved for the voluntary group, there is a piece that talks about education, civic education, values, sort of, right? about what can the OAS do, how can member states do to promote a sort of education, a civic education that emphasizes these values these shared values, right, which everyone agrees on. And, and I think that's the piece, that's certainly, I believe, my opinion, my well, the, one of the pieces that will gain quite a bit of consensus as we move forward on strengthening the charter. Um, and, um, you know, it's always going to be a resource issue, but we'll work with that. Uh, but I think that's the thing that's missing, right? And you, you notice if you look at the data uh, in Argentina, uh, not just in Argentina, that the level of dissatisfaction is highest among the young people, among the 18 to 25, 18 to 30, right? The cynicism and distrust is higher among that age group. And the question is why? Why is that the case? The children of the pandemic, you could say. Um, but also, you know, there's an argument that many have been made about education and civics that is missing in, in, in the region. Thank you. Herman, I, Herman Chulmir. Hi, um, hello, yeah. I am Herman Chulmir, I'm the founder of Foreign Energy Group and um, I am amazed about not only your words but also the, the questions that come out of the audience. And I'm going to take advantage of the fact that you're not a, a professor anymore or you're an acting professor and I'm speaking out on behalf of the US administration. You nail it when you talk about values, because democracy is a product of values. And democracy right now, especially in Latin America, it's a product that is very hard to sell. And my question to you is, considering the growing influence of China in these countries that we are trying to promote, where we're trying to promote uh, those values, and it's an influence that comes with no strings attached and it develops dependency relationships. How do you think we can do better? We, we can definitely do better. Um, how? Um, well, first of all, I think that Chinese is, is a, it's a sort of a clarion call for us to compete, right? We have to be up to the task. And I think the things that we're doing in this government are about exactly that. 
whether it's in the space of democracy. So this discussion about democracy is one way we do it, right? Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, in addition to the values you said, democracies have to show that they can deliver. Right? I am optimistic. Uh, I think there are important signs uh, in the region. I mentioned the resiliency of democracy despite the challenges. I think there are areas, um, sectors like energy or renewable energy that are very promising in the region. Um, there is a, a, a piece that I thought was very good and I think captures this and I recommend it. I, um, Brian Winter, who wrote uh, on the, I forget the, t the title of it, but it was Resilience, something or another. I think he captures uh, and gives the answer to all your question, which is, yes, there are all these challenges, here, no doubt, but we shouldn't be bogged down and obsessed by the challenges and look at the opportunities and things that are actually happening and invest time and resources in those things because the future may very well look bright in the areas of democracy, renewable energy. Um, he even talked about education, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I get some of the other areas um, in the piece, but I think he lays down some of the areas where we can begin to turn the corner. But to, but to answer your question and to turn it back to where I started, we have to, at least at the OAS, recommit ourselves. Let the public know, by the public I mean the Americas know, that the organization and its member states are, despite the challenges, still buying into democracy and to the institutions and to the instruments that strengthen democracy in the region. We will not abandon that because the moment that we abandon democracy and institutions, we are abandoning the people of the region and making them vulnerable to autocracies. As simple as that, in my mind. And that's why I don't want to use the word obsessive, but we at the U.S. mission are always insisting and pushing on this issue because probably now more than back 23 years ago or 22 years ago when the charter was signed, we need the charter now more than ever. And we need to strengthen it and recommit ourselves to it. I highly recommend <clears throat> on this issue the speech that the secretary gave at the General Assembly of the OAS last June, in June of this year, yes. He, could, he said it better than I could have. Thank you. I think one more question. Do we have time for one more question? Question right. Hi, Ambassador. Thank you for your, for your words. My name is Suleika Rivera, and I'm the Senior LGBTI Program Officer at Race and Equality. Um, the Williams Institute recently published a study that finds that backlash against LGBTI plus persons precedes democratic erosion. I think that we're seeing a lot of backlash in the region, in Brazil. Brazil continues to be the country that most murders trans person, followed by Mexico and the U.S. is third. Um, my question is, how does the U.S. see its role within the OAS of promoting and advancing the rights of LGBTI plus persons? And how are you working with other states to ensure this, as, this advancement as well? So, so thank you for that question. Um, I welcome you to see, I mean, the, the fact that you asked the question, I wonder whether it concerns me because it goes back to sort of demonstrating that the OS can and is having an impact because we are working a lot on those areas. Uh, there is a core group of LGBTI, there's a secretariat here that Betide uh, leads that is working this issue every day. Canada, um, is, is an important leader in this space. We participate, Mexico, uh, Colombia, uh, you know, many others are playing an important and powerful role on this issue of LGBTI. Um, I can tell you about what the PC, the Permanent Council is doing. Betile can tell you about what the tangible things that we are doing, I'm sorry, that the Secretariat is doing uh, in that space. Um, I, I, I am ashamed to say that I didn't know all the great work that the OS is doing 
in that particular space when I first arrived. So it's wonderful. I take advantage of your question uh, to end here, Rebecca, is <clears throat> people often, when they look at the OS, look at the permanent council and what the permanent council is doing or not doing. People get frustrated because they can't decide on this or decide on that. But there is another OAS that people don't talk about. And that's the secretariat, right, where Betile works. They do extraordinary, and I'm not using that word for, no, it's just, that's the definition. Extraordinary work on democracy, on human rights, on LGBTIQ rights, on a whole host of issues um, that is having a, an impact. The OAS is having an impact on training, capacity building in the region, areas of security. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Despite the financial and fiscal challenges that the organization faced, you have people like Betty and others who are struggling and mobilizing and moving forward to make and have an impact in the Americas. This is why approving the increase in the budget earlier this year, the first in, I think, 12 years, was so important. Not because the PC can have more conversation, it's because Matilde can continue doing her work. Way to end. I encourage you to speak with Matilde after. Thank you so much, Frank. This was just, it was wonderful to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. all so much yes. for joining us. Thank you.